Don't rub your eyes. Disinfect surfaces. Avoid shaking hands with others. We've learned to be careful with what we touch. But COVID-19 might be in the air too. Aerosol particles carrying the virus are tiny. They float on air currents. It takes them hours to settle. Expelled through the mouth of a coronavirus carrier, the air can help them spread. To be able to imagine aerosols, experts say to think of cigarette smoke spreading around a person like a cloud. The closer the smoker, the denser the cloud. How can you protect yourself? In many places, lockdowns have ended and countries are trying to regulate the restart of economic and public activity, which may be more difficult than thought because studies suggest the coronavirus could be hovering in the air of offices, shops and restaurants to which people are now slowly returning. The tables are far apart, different groups of guests even farther. The waiter wears a mask and everyone is expected to wash their hands a lot. That's restaurant life in the age of coronavirus. But such precautions don't mean people are necessarily safe. That's because of aerosols. This footage shows how coughing, exhaling, speaking and singing send forth a shower of larger droplets and tiny ones called aerosols. The greater the effort, the greater the dispersal. Those droplets and aerosols can carry virus particles. Professor Martin Kriegel at the Technical University of Berlin is studying the dissemination of aerosols in the air. He uses light and soap bubbles. The trouble is that aerosols are so light they can be carried greater distances on the air than regular droplets, which drop to the ground quite quickly. This is a problem particularly in enclosed spaces. Consider this, you're in a room. After half an hour you will have filled it with aerosols as you breathe. Anybody else there will come into contact with some of them. We won't know who gets infected and who doesn't. But in statistical terms, the more people in the room, the more potential cases of infection. Aerosols are tiny, but potentially dangerous. They can transport a whole range of viruses. The SARS-CoV-2 virus has a diameter of about 0.12 microns. The diameter of an aerosol is 40 to 80 times as long. And a strand of human hair much bigger still. A number of studies suggest aerosols are a vector for the coronavirus. What implications does that have for strategies to prevent its spread? A cough can propel aerosols several meters. A simple mask won't effectively hold them back, as Professor Kriegel has demonstrated in his lab. Eighty to ninety percent of these aerosols escape such a mask and enter the surrounding air. Nevertheless, it is important to wear a mask to hinder to some degree the uncontrolled dispersal of breath into space. And if I have to walk past somebody, say in the supermarket, it does make sense. Good ventilation can help. In this experiment, fresh air is pumped into a room at the blue circles. Stale air is sucked out at the brown ones. What we see is that aerosols don't spread throughout the space, and that reduces the risk of infection. An open window can have the same effect. So if you want to eat out, choose a big, airy restaurant, or even better, eat outside if possible. That way, viral particles can disperse swiftly on the breeze. Let's get more on this with William Schaffner. He is a professor of preventive medicine and an expert on infectious diseases at the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine in Nashville, Tennessee. Good to have you on the program, Professor. We have all learned that staying apart six feet could be life-saving in this pandemic. Is this still the case when aerosols that we emit can travel comparably long distances through the air? Well, for the most part, yes because most of the aerosols that we uh, produce fall down within three to six feet. 
Occasionally, they get a bit farther than that, but six feet is practical. It's something that everybody can remember and understand. And so we focus on six feet. That will get 95% of the issue. How far along are we in studying what role aerosols are playing in the transmission of the coronavirus? Well, we think the vast amount of transmission occurs through close person-to-person -person contact within rooms over prolonged periods of time. So it's really that close-in contact with many other people that puts you at risk. On occasion, the virus can travel a little farther, but that's not nearly important as getting people to uh, be aware that close-in transmission is really where the major issue is. So more and more people are returning to their jobs. In light of that, how should offices and the work there be set up? Yeah, that's providing all kinds of difficulties and opportunities at the same time. So as you know, uh, barriers have been put up in many workplaces between people. And in some offices and other work situations, people can be separated more. In other circumstances, people are urged to wear masks for most of the day. Uh, that's difficult for some people. We will not have perfect solutions for absolutely every circumstance, but if we do a series of things, wearing the masks, six foot distancing, good hand hygiene, avoiding large crowds, we will be able to reduce the transmission of this virus. Let's talk about air conditioning systems. Are they helpful or harmful? I think they're, they, they are helpful because uh, obviously they cool us in the summer, make us more comfortable and more productive. And the air conditioning systems really, we think, play very little, if any, role in transmission. There is one provocative study from China, and even that is not a perfect study. So we really think that air conditioning does not play a role in transmitting this virus. Now, in the past days, thousands of people in various countries have protested against racism and police brutality. How dangerous are these mass gatherings from an infectious disease uh, standpoint? Of course, we in infectious diseases are concerned. These are important social and cultural events, absolutely. But they do bring many people together for long periods of time, and they're chanting and shouting, and uh, that opens them up to exposure to the COVID virus if it's there. So many people are wearing masks. That's a very good thing. And of course, they're out of doors, which helps diffuse the virus, dilute the virus, so it makes it less hazardous. I'm sure that the COVID virus was present at some of those demonstrations and some people acquired infection. I'm, I'm, I, I think it was not a major problem, however. Professor William Schaffner, thank you for your thoughts. Thank you. My pleasure. And now it is over to our science correspondent and resident coronavirus expert, Derek Williams, answering the questions you sent us. How high are the risks of catching the virus when traveling on a long distance train, even with social distancing, where the windows don't open and air is circulated? It's impossible to put a number on this, but a couple of studies have shown that public transport is high on the list of, of risky settings for contracting the disease. Um, we're pretty certain by now that enclosed spaces pose more of a threat than outdoors. And, and something like a high-speed train with windows that won't open is certainly an enclosed space, even if it has air circulation systems. Um, many governments are still recommending that people avoid trains as much as possible. But, but if you have to take one, you should definitely adhere to the fundamental rules we've all heard so many times now. Um, whenever possible, keep two meters away from others, uh, wear a mask, and, and avoid touching your face when you're on the train. Do temperature and humidity have an effect on SARS-CoV-2's basic reproduction number? There's been a lot of conflicting information and data on this. Um, so far, 
the general consensus appears to be that higher temperatures and higher humidity both slow the spread of the virus, uh, but, but not by much. Uh, a major new study awaiting peer review compared pandemic data and weather data from thousands of locations all over the globe. Now, those researchers came to the conclusion that, that temperate zones will probably face more risk in winter, whereas warm areas, especially humid ones, might see slower transmission rates. But the impact of summer this year, they thought, won't be enough to stop the pandemic. And, and looking at how COVID-19 is hitting Brazil, it certainly looks like temperature and humidity don't seem to play really major roles in, in changing infection rates. How many people were infected by MERS and SARS? The virus that causes COVID-19 is the third coronavirus in the last two decades to jump from animals to humans. Uh, the SARS epidemic also began in China, and the virus that causes it is also thought to have originated in bats before crossing to, to civets and then jumping on to humans. Before we got it under control, SARS had infected over 8,000 people in dozens of countries all over the world and killed over 770 of them. There have been no new reported cases of it for, for over 15 years now, though. MERS, or Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, on the other hand, is, is still very much with us. It's also thought to have originated in bats and then passed to humans via camels. Um, Fortunately, it doesn't spread as quickly or easily as COVID-19, although it is a lot more lethal. It, it kills around a third of the people who contract it. Um, so far, there have been around 2,500 MERS cases worldwide and over 850 deaths caused by it. <laughs> 